Good evening. Welcome to Dunmo Baptist Church. Let's pray. Almighty God and loving Father, we thank you for this time set aside for worship and thank you, Lord, that you have brought us together around your word, even if we are separated in time and space, we are one as we meet together around your throne of grace. Lord, speak to us through your word this evening, reveal to us things that we have never known, and remind us of things that we have known. And help us, Lord, to have a greater appreciation of the wonder of our Saviour. Lord, deliver us from all the distractions which are crowding in upon us. Help us to concentrate. And bless us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our reading this evening is taken from Deuteronomy and chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 to 22. Now. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 9. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughter as an offering, anyone who practices divination or tells fortunes or interprets omens, or a sorcerer or a charmer or a medium or a necromancer or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. You shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For all these nations which you are about to dispossess, listen to fortune tellers and to diviners. But as for you, the Lord your God has not allowed you to do this. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired in the, of the Lord in your God at Horeb on the day of assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how may we know that the word that the Lord has spoken? When, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is the word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for that portion of your word. Help us as we seek to consider it together this evening. Lord, we are looking for pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament, and we ask that you will open our eyes that we may see him and understand something more of him from this passage of Scripture. Teach us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Moses, a picture of Jesus. Deuteronomy chapter 18 and verse 18. God says, I will raise up from among them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I commanded him. 
Now, as we noted last week, there are so many pictures of Jesus in the Old Testament that picking out even the main ones is really quite a difficult task. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, so many pictures of Jesus in so many different ways, and they're all worthy of attention, obviously, because each one has a different angle. Each one shows another aspect of the life and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But we haven't time and I haven't the ability to pick them all out and deal with them adequately. So just the obvious ones. And this week I've chosen Moses because as our text says, I will raise up for them, for the people, a prophet like you. Moses is a, a standard for all the prophets that follow him. And Jesus, of course, is the fulfilment of all the prophets. He is the great prophet. Because as uh, God says in verse 18, I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak them to you, uh, speak them all that I command him. Jesus, of course, spoke nothing other than the word of God. Jesus very specifically claimed to fulfill this prophecy in John chapter 12 and verse 49. John 12 verse 49, Jesus says there, I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. Jesus is the fulfilment of the picture of the prophets, uh, and specifically in context of Moses. Moses, of course, was merely human. We, we know his parents. They were Amram and Jochebed. You can read about it in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 20. We know that Moses was far from perfect. He was a sinner. Um, Moses knew it too. In fact, in Exodus 6 and verse 30, he says, I am of uncircumcised lips. That is to say, he's, uh, he's not sanctified. He, he says a lot of things he shouldn't say. And in Psalm 106, verse 52, uh, sorry, 32 to 33, um, the psalmist records that Moses proved that point conclusively. Let's just find Psalm 106. Psalm 106 and verse uh, 32. They, the children of Israel, angered God at the waters of Meribah, and it went ill with Moses on their account, for they made his spirit bitter, and he spoke rashly with his lips. Moses said, I've got uncircumcised lips, and he proved it. He spoke rashly with his lips. As James says, the one who doesn't sin in word, the same is a perfect man. Moses wasn't one. So we can't push the picture too far because Jesus was a perfect man. Jesus didn't sin in any way, shape or form. So let's have a look at this picture. Moses, picture of Jesus. I want to look at his life, the law and leading. Life, law and leading. Text being Deuteronomy 18.18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. The life of Moses, actually, is quite instructive. He was a royal prince. You remember the famous story, possibly, of Moses being <clears throat> put as a baby into a basket and hidden amongst the flags at the side of the River Nile and um, being found by... Pharaoh's daughter, and Pharaoh's daughter adopted him. And so Moses was a royal prince. He was got plenty of money, he was well educated, he was powerful, and a brilliant future in Egypt awaited him. But he gave it all up, all on account of his desire to help his people. The Hebrews. In Exodus chapter 2, 
verses 11 to 15. We read that Moses one day went out, when he had grown up, he went out to his people and looked at their burdens. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. And he looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And when he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man that did in the wrong, Why did you strike your companion? And he answered, Who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. So, and then down in 3 verse 1, Moses kept the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. So, he was a prince. He was in the king's court. He was rich and powerful. But because of trying to help his people out of slavery, Moses became a shepherd. Israel didn't want his help. <laughs> and that's so much a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, King of glory, and he came down from heaven to be the Good Shepherd, who lays down his life for the sheep, and so many people in Israel didn't want his help. We have no king but Caesar. Once Moses had received his um, commission from God at the burning bush, Moses' whole life thereafter was dedicated to speaking God's word to God's people and in leading God's people out of slavery to sin and on to the promised land. He cared for them, he cared about them, he prayed for them, he prayed with them, he taught them, and he was incredibly patient with them. And he was only a man. Jesus, of course, does that perfectly. His whole life dedicated to delivering us from evil, from the slavery to the devil, and uh, giving us God's word, and doing us good, leading us into the promised land. And God gave Moses power to do miracles, which proved his authority. Moses was the human agency whereby the plagues came on Egypt, the way was made through the Red Sea, water came out of the rock, and so on. And Jesus did many, many signs that proved the truth of his words and his authority. Remember that time when the man was let down through the roof and Jesus said, Son, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees said, Who can forgive sins but God only? And Jesus said, Well, which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say get up and walk? But just so you may know that I have authority on earth to forgive sins, get up and walk. And the man got up and walked. So Jesus proved his authority. You read through Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Moses' life in so many ways foreshadows that of Jesus. Worked so hard, cared so much, and generally speaking was so little appreciated by the people he cared about. But the main point is Moses' love. Love for this frankly undeserving and ungrateful people. Moses never gave up on them. Remember after the uh, business with the golden calf, when Moses had been up on the mountain, listening to God, receiving God's law, he came down and found that the people had got fed up with waiting for him. They'd made a golden calf. They were dancing around it. They were making offerings to it. They were breaking the Ten Commandments, which only a few weeks earlier they had promised to keep. You know, thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image of anything, and so on. And they'd made themselves a graven image, and they were bowing down to it. And in Exodus 32 and verse 9, God says, I have seen this people. Behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, that I may consume them, in order that I may make a great nation out of you. Moses, think about it. The people of Moses... I'll make a nation out of you. 
But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Turn from your anger. Relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself, saying, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and so on. Moses interceded for this people. He loved them. Moses was a great man. Such love for such unlovely people. And Jesus is so, so much greater. He loves us with an everlasting love. He intercedes for us before the face of God. He pleads the merits of his sacrifice before God every time we sin. It's a picture, a faint one. All the other prophets, of course, the faithful prophets, they too gave up their lives to bring God's word to God's people. And generally speaking, God's people were most ungrateful. So the picture runs through. Moses is a picture of the other prophets and they're all a picture which is fulfilled in Christ. So what about the law? We've looked at the life. What about the law? Remember there, verse 16, just as you desired of the Lord on the day, uh, Lord your God at Horeb on the day of assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. The people were so terrified when God spoke to them from the top of Sinai, that they implored God that he would just speak to Moses and Moses could speak to them. And God said, yeah, that's good. And so when Jesus comes, it's actually Jesus is the Lord, but he's come in human form. Jesus became one of us. He lived among us. He was as like us. So in the Old Testament, God speaks via Moses, who is a man. In the New Testament, God speaks himself as a man. Moses gave the people God's law. Moses gave the people a complete set of rules and regulations for running a country. Everything they needed to know to stop being a rabble of slaves and to start being a civilised, organised, decent people and a country that served God. He gave them all the rules for justice, for wrongdoers, for care of the poor, for feast days and fast days, how to rejoice in God's goodness, the way for sinful people to come to God and know God as a friend, sacrifices, offerings, how people could actually come into the presence of God with joy. We considered the Passover a few weeks back. And above all, in Exodus um, 31, 12 to 16, God says, remember the Sabbath. Let me find that quote there. In Exodus 31 and verse 12. The Lord said to Moses, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths. For this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. For in six days shall work be done. But the seventh day is a Sabbath, a solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. Above all, the Sabbath, what we would call Sunday. Now, at first glance, you think Moses had been teaching the people that sacrifices and the way to God was the, the most Christ-like aspect of his uh, message. 
You know, Jesus came to bring us into fellowship with God. Jesus is the sacrifice that takes away our sin. So why do we have this above all the Sabbath line? Jesus did teach about sacrifices and the way to God. Jesus is both the sacrifice and the way. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And we could spend a long time looking at the sacrificial law and seeing how Jesus fulfills it, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But why the Sabbath? John 1 verse 17 tells us the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And Paul says in Galatians 3.24, the law was our guardian, or the AV says a schoolmaster, until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. In the Old Testament, yes, there was a lot about sacrifices, sacrifices that had to go on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Never finished with them. But above all of that, It was the Sabbath. You see, the law and its sacrifice is only ever a picture. Animal blood cannot take away human sins, Hebrews 10.4. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. The Old Testament believers were not justified by the blood of bulls and goats. They were justified by faith. They offered their sacrifices and they looked by faith to the sacrifice of Christ which those animals represented. Jesus, God's salvation, God's work. Salvation is God's work. And you think what the Sabbath is, it's the, the seventh day, the day when God had finished his work and he rested. And that's why the people of Israel were to remember the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. Yes, they offered their sacrifices and they looked by faith for something God was going to do and they rested on the Sabbath day in what God has done. They stopped doing their own works because salvation is by faith, not works. And that's why the Sabbath day moved from the seventh day to the first day of the week, because it was on the first day of the week that Jesus rose from the dead. God's salvation complete. And so with the Old Testament, it was so important that the people should symbolically rest in what God was doing, what God had done, not what they'd done. By faith, they looked forward. So it's in the New Testament, we rest in what God has done. Jesus, we rest on the Sabbath and rejoice in God's complete finished work in Jesus. God's salvation is finished in Jesus. We don't get to heaven by works. There's nothing we can do that will get us to heaven. We get to heaven by resting in what Jesus has done. So Old Testament, rest in what God has done, the Sabbath. New Testament, rest in what God has done, Jesus rising from the dead. So the Sabbath is the most important thing, and that's what Moses said. Above all, keep the Sabbath. And above all, we keep the Sabbath. We rest in Jesus. But of course, we have to do the law. <laughs> As Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So, yes, we follow Jesus. Yes, we serve Jesus. Yes, we obey Jesus. But when it comes to it, our rest, our eternal peace and expectation is completely fixed, resting in what Christ has done. Nothing we do, we can't add to it. We rest in his work. So... We've looked at the life, and we've looked at the law. How about the leading? Moses' life gives us similarities to Jesus' life. Moses' law 
is a picture of Jesus. Everywhere you look at it, there's pictures of Jesus, especially in the Sabbath. The leading. So far as Israel was concerned, Moses was the way out of slavery in Egypt. Moses was the way out of the situation at the Red Sea. Moses was the way across the desert and the way into the promised land. Just follow Moses and you'll get there. Those who uh, disobeyed Moses or distrusted Moses, they had problems. But those few who trusted him all the way through, like Joshua and Caleb, they got out of Egypt safely through the desert and safely into Canaan. And Moses had God's words face to face. Deuteronomy 34 verses 10 to 12. Moses was a great godly man. There has not arisen since in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, none like him for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to his land, for all his mighty power and all the great deeds of terror that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. None, that is, until Jesus, who came, like Moses, from among the people. He was born in Bethlehem. He was raised in Nazareth. And he is the way out of slavery to sin. He's the way across the desert of life into glory. Problems only come when we don't follow him, when we doubt his leadership, when we disobey his commands. Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by him. If we follow Christ, if we trust him, if in every difficulty we ask his help, not complaining about it, but asking him, resting in him, Guaranteed. Moses would guaranteed take the people across to the land of promise. Jesus guaranteed to take us safe to heaven. Jesus is the way. He is the spiritual reality of that which Moses physically was a picture. You know, we, we, we looked at the Passover lamb. Jesus is how the, Egypt, uh, the children of Israel escaped death and got out of slavery. Moses led them through all of that. Moses told them what to do. Jesus is the reality of what Moses taught. Sin is the reality of the slavery which Israel had in Egypt. Life is the reality of the wilderness desert that the children of Israel crossed to get to the promised land. Heaven is the reality represented by the promised land. The pictures, but they're good pictures. And if you look at it, God's promise, I will raise up from among them a prophet like you, from among their own brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. He shall speak to them all that I command you. Jesus gave us exactly what God had told us. He spoke the truth. He promised to lead us, to teach us, to guide us, to shepherd us. In John 3, verse 19, 20, Jesus says, This is the judgment. Light has come into the world. People love darkness rather than light because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But... Whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen 
that his works have been carried out in God. Those who refuse to follow Moses, those who refuse to believe Moses, they stayed slaves in Egypt. Those who refuse to follow Jesus, they stay slaves to sin. There was no way out apart from Jesus. Those who followed close to Moses and obeyed everything he said and did, they were the happiest on the journey. Those who moaned and groaned, they suffered quite a lot on the journey. But the fact remains, those who followed arrived safely. But those who rebelled didn't. God is the only way. Jesus is the only way. Under Moses' leadership, of course, Israel had to face a lot of problems. They had to face the, uh, the Red Sea. They had to face the privations of living in the wilderness. They had to face the problems of hostile tribes in the wilderness. And Jesus says that uh, we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom. You know, following Jesus is not, a, not an afternoon picnic. It's, it's a difficult route. He does lead us through difficult places. He does lead us in, well, places which we wouldn't naturally wish to go. We can remember David in the Psalms, he, he, the Lord is my shepherd. Yes, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Great, but also, though I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod, thy staff, they comfort me. No, we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We will have tribulation. But God's will will be done. And it is God's will that whoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. And Jesus said, I am the way. Just like Moses was the way. If you followed Moses, you get there safely. If you follow Christ, we will get there safely. No one comes to the Father but through me. Which brings us back again, of course, to that point which we covered in the last bit. The Sabbath. Resting in what God has done. Jesus said, it is finished. And he laid down his life. Jesus rose again triumphantly. That's the day we remember. We rest in what Christ has done in his conquest of sin and death on the cross. We can't conquer sin. We can't conquer death. Jesus has. We rest in him. It's a picture in the Old Testament. It's a fact in the New. May God help us to believe it. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this picture in the Old Testament of what Jesus has accomplished. Lord, grant that each one of us may follow the way, may trust in the Lord, May be obedient to everything you direct us to do and may rest entirely in the work which Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. He has conquered death. He has paid for sin. And if we rest in what he has done, trusting him and following him, we cannot fail to arrive in glory. Lord, Forgive our sins. Forgive our failures. Help us to rejoice in Jesus. For Jesus' sake. Amen.